Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, today is my pleasure to introduce Luca Govia, who's going to give us a talk called Characterizing High Fidelity Quantum Devices. Luca uh, works at the moment as a research scientist at IBM Quantum before he was a research scientist at Raytheon BBN. Uh, he has had quite a productive career since he got started. Uh, he got his PhD at Saarland University under Frank Wilhelm. Wilhelm. Uh, then he did several postdoctoral appointments at McGill and University of, of Chicago with Ash Clerk. Uh, besides characterization and benchmarking, he also is interested and has done research in open quantum systems, circuit QED, and quantum measurement. And finally, uh, he is the sec sec secretary treasurer of the Division of Quantum Information Science at the APS. Take it away, Luca. It's all yours. Great. Thank you. Um, let me thank you for the kind introduction and let me share my slides. All right. So, okay. Uh, should be full screen now. All right. Great. So, yeah, thanks um, for inviting me. I'm really happy to, give, to come here and give this talk. Uh, and as I, as I was mentioning uh, before, I've recently actually moved to uh, just a hop, skip, and a jump away from you all. So um, it's nice to be giving a talk also in my time zone for once. Uh, yeah, so today I, I want to talk about um, work on device characterization, uh, in particular as devices get better and better. Um, uh, may, maybe packed a fit bit too much into this into this talk, but I will. Um, Try to uh, try to get through the majority of it, and please interrupt at any point in time um, if you have questions. So you know, there's there's a couple topics I want to cover, and I think I just want to start first of all um, with some motivation. Uh, and you know, when you look at how the field has progressed, especially in the last couple of years, you can see that you know that's sort of an obvious statement that devices are getting bigger and more complex, right? So here's an example. Um, here we have uh, this is an IBM Washington or IBM Washington, which is a an Eagle device that has um, 127 qubits, so that's a lot, right? And at the same time, you can also see that we're getting better and better at controlling these devices, right? Our errors, our error rates continue to decrease. So, you know, this is just as, again, I'm obviously I'm from IBM Quantum, so I'm showing some IBM results where you see as we over over the years, our our you know average and best case two qubit error rates or C naught error rates have have considerably gone down. So that's you know all really exciting and, and, and excellent work and, and a lot of hard work from the team. Um, but it, for those of us who worry about benchmarking and characterization, it, it poses actually some interesting challenges, right? Um, as we get to more and more qubits, we have to be able to understand what's going on for more and more qubits, right? Um, sorry, someone have a question? Okay, I'll continue. Um, and in particular, you know, one of the big questions that I have and that the, our, the team here has is, how do we understand the impact of what we call spectator qubits? So those qubits that are not necessarily engaged or involved in a gate or an operation, how do those how are those impacting performance, right? Um, and I think there is, is, you know, the several million dollar question is, if you care about the total error rate on a system for some sort of application, is it sufficient to just add all the individual error rates up? Or is there a way that the error is combined on trivially, right? On the other hand, as errors get better and better or lower and lower, right? Um, the things that we normally have forgotten about or neglected because we're physicists that we only go to second order and perturbation theory, um, those are actually gonna start to dominate as the errors in our system. And these errors can be quite exotic and moreover, they're things that we haven't been used to dealing with. So there's a the question of how do we actually understand what are the dominant error sources gonna be as we move into this realm of higher performance devices. So, you know, this sort of uh, opens up the question of why should you care about quantum characterization, verification and validation or QCVB, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of ways to motivate this, right? The, the first thing is, okay, well, we wanna make our devices better, right? We, we do need to push error rates and, and lower and lower, right? But the parameter space for experiments is, is enormous, right? So we need, to, we need some guide to what needs to be made better. Um, also, you know, we're developing new capabilities all the time, right? Mid-circuit measurement is something that's become very, that's coming online more and more in different platforms, not just at IBM, as well as dynamic circuits or control, classical controlled operations like feed forward. And these are bringing with them in a whole new slew a new, of, error, of error sources, right? So we again, need to be able to characterize these new sources as well. And then from the flip side, if you're you know, not so hardware or device inclined, right? Even if we wanna make better algorithms, circuits, or say error mitigation techniques, right? 
we should care about the specifics of the noise and the specifics of the error on a device, right? For as an example, we have things like noise aware compiling or circuit mapping, right? Uh, just one example I should, uh, I'm, I'm quoting here. And then we have um, some other ideas in the error mitigation front about using learned error channels to do error mitigation, like a scheme, like the probabilistic error cancellation scheme that IBM recently uh, has presented. So, okay. That's my you know, big picture motivation for why I care about the things that I care about and I do. Um, and now I kind of want to go towards some more specific examples that fit into this overall, overall framework. So the first thing I want to tell you about is uh, the development of a mid-circuit measurement benchmarking suite um, that I did with uh, Petr Yurcevic, Seth Merkel, and Dave McKay, uh, all at IBM. And you can find the details about this here in this uh, archive posting. Um, and then, but you know, so if you have any questions, if there are more details that you're missing, please go there. Um, I should also mention that all the data and code also is available uh, in a Zenodo link that's, that is in the archive posting. So first of all, just to set the scene, you know, what is mid-circuit measurement, right? Um, and well, you know, this is maybe an obvious statement given its name, but it's measurements that occur during a circuit, right? So we're no longer concerning ourselves with just uh, certain situations where we're measuring only at the end or a terminal measurement. Right, that, that ends the circuit. We now are thinking about using circuits or using, sorry, me measurements in our circuit, right? Interleave with gates. Um, this is you know, a really clear place where this comes up, right? That we're probably all familiar with, which is an error correction, right? Where normally you think about repeatedly measuring some ancilla qubit, right? As an example, in something like a stabilizer check circuit, right? For here, this is a parity for a weight for parity check for the surface code. You're measuring one ancilla after it's, you have to do a couple of C naught gates or four C naught gates with different qubits. In the context of what I'm gonna to talk to you about, we don't plan to do anything with the measurement outcomes. So we're not going to be using it for feed forward or anything like that. We just care about understanding how the mid circuit measurements themselves impact the qubit that's being measured. And in particular, the qubits that are not being measured. So the spectator or the other qubits in the circuit. And what I want to argue is that the way we typically benchmark measurements, which is by assignment fidelity, is not good enough for these for, for, the, for these purposes, right? So as an example, you know, this is just pulled from one of the recent IBM um, uh, error correction papers. But you know, we uh, at least in circuit QED, one would normally think about characterizing assignment fidelity perhaps by looking at the IQ traces and the the overlap between the two uh, distributions, but. That's not good enough for a mid-circuit measurement. Um, and one of the major reasons is like I mentioned before, we actually care about how it impacts other qubits, not the one being measured, right? Um, and moreover, because we're gonna potentially be reusing this qubit in further operations in the circuit, we also care about what happens to the qubit itself, right? And it's not good enough to just say, okay, the qubit was in zero. We care that the qubit remains in zero after the measurement, right? So we care about things like projection errors or what are commonly called non-quantum non-demolition or non-QND errors happening on the measured qubit. So let's dive a little bit more detail into these errors to understand what they might, what they really are, just and then think about how we're going to characterize them. So on the one hand, we have the fact that we care about how measurement of say an ancilla is going to impact data qubits or other qubits, right? And again, taking an example from a recent D equals three surface code paper from or uh, error correction code paper from IBM, imagine you're measuring the ancilla qubit in blue, right? Well, you might anticipate that because they're coupled, there's going to be some error potentially on qubit 16 and 17 or 18, sorry, these data qubits. And we know, you know, if you're a circuit QED device person, you know that this could be due to something like cross defasing, so some leakage of measurement photons from one readout resonator to another that causes measurement of adjacent qubits or a start shift, right? Um, again, just a, a phase shift on, on the unmeasured qubits. On the flip side, you also have that the state of the data qubits could be impacting the measurement of the ancilla. Um, so that's also something else we want to understand. And importantly, it's not enough to just say, okay, well, these errors are here. Let's estimate them maybe by some device theory. We want to really devise a way to quantify the impact of these errors. Um, so something we can measure about the devices. And then, like I mentioned before, the other, it, you know, the other avenue is the fact that the measurement may not leave the qubit in the state that it's reporting as the outcome, right? Um, and one way to look at that is to look at, as an example, again, from this, this Chen et al. paper is to look at what they call the QND probability, which is just sort of, which is just, you know, the probability that you measure zero and measure zero again with two measurements in a row uh, or one and one, and then just average those two. And, you know, if this measurement was perfectly QND, you would expect 
this to be one, but you see that's not, and there are some significant deviations, so significant non-QND error. You know, this could be because, well, maybe the measurement is just demolition. Maybe it's just destroying the state of the qubit. Um, but maybe there's something a little bit more sophisticated going on. Maybe there's something like a, a misalignment of how, the how much of How much of that error is non-QND or is just the one decaying in between the two measurements? Uh, for these particular cases, I'm not sure, though. Give, uh, these, these are chained measurements repeated one after the other. So there should be a, uh, like I can't give you a quantitative number. But I don't think that there should have been uh, what is this like six percent population how long, decay. How long does your measurement take? Uh, these measurements were seven hundred nanoseconds, and these qubits yeah. have T ones that are over one hundred fifty microseconds. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you know that is a, definitely a source one one source of of, of issue of, of this kind of error. Or well, it's not really a non QND error as, as I think you're alluding to. It's actually like a uh, a red herring, um, but that will show up in, the, in this sort of measurement. Um, I think there's a question in the chat, uh, although I cannot open the chat right now. Oh, wait, here I go. How long do you wait for your read? Oh, uh, so that the 700 nanoseconds is the total. That's a very, very good question. The seven, uh, sorry, the question is how long do you wait for readout resonators to ring down? Um, the 700 nanoseconds is the total time. Uh, the pulse is actually uh, about half of that, and then the rest is ring down time. So there should be no uh, photons left in the, in the readout resonator. Um, Can I ask another question? Do you sure. choose the shape of the readout pulse specifically to try to like uh, optimize the ring down time? I do not think these pulses are optimized. Um, I think this is just, uh, I mean, in the sense that I don't think they're optimized to do something like clear, uh, to actually try to deplete the cavity. I think the ring down is just uh, the, the lifetime decay of the cavity. All right. Okay. Okay. So uh, in that case, let me move on. Um, right. So, okay. The, the oh, sorry, I need to get back into my slides. All right. So the big question then overall is, okay, is how do we quantify these errors? Right. Um, so, you know, or and especially if you don't have device physics knowledge uh, about what could be going on. Right. So the the one way to do this is just to say, okay, I'm going to completely characterize measurement as a process. Right. And here it's important that you're not doing detector tomography. You're not characterizing the, uh, the action of measurement, you're characterizing the process of measurement in the sense that you care about the state that the qubits are left in after measurement, right? Um, so here, it's actually not a quantum process, it's actually what's called a quantum instrument, because uh, it has a classical value associated with it, depending on the outcome. Um, and there's been a couple different examples of doing this, uh, in circuit QED at least, here are some of the references. Uh, but of course, the problem with all of this is that, you know, this process tomography is enormously resource intensive, right? And it's really hard for me to believe that um, any of these approaches will scale, you know, something to, to maybe to a four qubit parity check, but even that is really pushing it, I think. Um, so what we want is a way that is light on resources, but gives us a quantitative answer. Uh, so what we want is a benchmark, right? Something we can quickly measure to get an answer of how good our mid-circuit measurements are. So, you know, when you say benchmark, the field naturally thinks randomized benchmarking. Um, so. I'm sure you, many of you are familiar with randomized benchmarking. So I just wanted to give a very brief overview of my interpretation of what it is. Um, and I think, you know, one way I like to think about it is that it is indeed not just a single protocol anymore. It's really a family of protocols. I really like this reference from Helsin um, as, a, as a sort of uh, overview of all, the, all the, the diversity that is randomized benchmarking now. And I think the, to me, the essence of it is that you take a, a construction of random circuits that modifies the or modifies the error the average error in a way that can be easily quantified right so for instance you know i'm going to focus on clifford rb where clifford rb twirls error to be a depolarizing channel so there's only a single number that you care about that you can efficiently benchmark uh, and clifford rb of course op operates by repeating clifford gates followed by their inverse so that you should ideally return to whatever state you started in and then you fit that return probability to an exponential um, where, as I'm sure you all are familiar, A and B capture state preparation and measurement error, and P is a metric for the quality of your average Clifford gate. Uh, so we're going to take RB and we're going to develop a measurement benchmarking procedure from it. And to do that, we're actually going to need insights from three different flavors of RB. Um, the standard Clifford RB that I just discussed. We're also going to need to understand interleaved RB, where you interleave um, 
gates between these Cliffords that and you care about, or a single kind of gate, and you care about uh, benchmarking that particular gate, that interleave gate. Uh, and we're also going to need to understand some of the results from simultaneous Clifford RB, which discusses sort of what happens when you perform single qubit or, or two qubit RB across more than one or two qubits at the same time. So this is it. This is here, mid-circuit measurement RB. And I want to point out that this is really a benchmarking suite, right? So it's going to consist of three protocols, the first of which we also call mid-circuit measurement RB. Um, and what that consists of is on a subset of qubits that we will call control, um, which I have previously been calling data or spectator, uh, we will perform Clifford RB, right? We'll perform Clifford, we'll, uh, we'll, you know, we'll do Clifford gates. And then between these Clifford gates, we're gonna interleave measurements on another subset of qubits that we will call the ancillas, right? Um, so from the perspective of the control, this just looks like an interleaved idle, but in reality, it's an interleaved measurement on a different qubit, right? So the sequence is, you know, Clifford measurement, Clifford measurement, et cetera, et cetera, over on. Uh, and I wanna point out that this was done before by uh, the group that is now Quantinium. But um, what really separates our work from theirs is that we go from just a single protocol to a suite by introducing two reference uh, sequences. The first of which uh, we call delay RB, uh, where as its name implies, you replace the measurements on the ancilla with just delays right, of equal duration to the measurement time. And the reason we do that is because we really wanna isolate the error that just occurs during measurement due to measurement, not just due to the fact that you're idling and you will have T1 and T2 decay. Um, and this reference sequence allows us to do that, right? It allows us to opt to use these, you know, these the results of these two sequences as an IRB procedure to estimate the error of measurement induces on the controls, right? Uh, by sort of like referencing out the intrinsic T1 and T2 decay of the control qubits. Uh, and then the third protocol is sort of the reverse of this where we replace um, the Clifford gates with idols or with the, and the, and leave the measurements alone. And the reason we do that is, you know, actually just because you could just do repeated measurements with no inter no delay between them, but there are some kinds of non QE errors in particular ones that have to do with basis misalignment uh, between logical and measurement that we, uh, that you will more likely see if you do interleave these, these idols. Um, so that's why we do this one as well. So what this, you know, what these three, what this whole suite gives you, what these three protocols give you is they basically give you a set of six numbers, you know, per control ancilla qubit pair, right? You're gonna have the error per Clifford of the control qubits for each of the three protocols. And you're gonna have the error the error per measurement of the ancilla qubits for each of the three protocols, right? And then by looking at these errors, we can classify different kinds of error. So we can say, okay, um, if you know things behave as if the measurement wasn't there, great. We don't have any measurement, any measurement error, right? If we see significant error per measurement when we do repeated measurements, right? Then we probably have some sort of non-QND error, especially if the control qubits are otherwise unimpacted, right? However, if we see that the control qubit de decay curves are very different whether or not we do measurement or not, right? If there's more error when you do measurements, then we could say, okay, well maybe the measurement is inducing an error on the control. And then the last one that we, or that at least we're gonna talk about today is that, okay, well, if the measurement, you know, if there's both the fact that the measurement induces an error on the control qubits and the, the ancilla curves themselves decay a lot when you do measurement, then maybe there's some sort of induced two qubit error that's impacting both the ancilla and the control at the same time. Um, you could also, you can also detect just like standard crosstalk between RB gates here, uh, but we're gonna not focus on that because we're really interested in what happens during measurement. Uh, one thing I want to be upfront about, of course, is that, you know, this is a benchmarking scheme, right? And while these error classifications can give us some information about the different kinds of error, and what qubits there are being impacted, um, we can't learn, we are not going to learn anything about the different physical mechanisms behind the error, right? Um, so we don't know if it's a start shift or cross the phasing. You know, to understand that, you really need um, device physics knowledge to sort of a priori know what's the most likely thing to be happening or going wrong. Of course, what we do get is a quantitative estimate for the error, right? We do get this quantitative estimate for um, the error that the, the measurement induces on the control qubits. So what I'm gonna do for the rest of this part of the talk now is show you examples of these different kinds of error signatures that you might see if you run MCMRB. And I'm gonna show you examples of results taken on IBM peak skill. 
Um, and I've done you know, two different configurations here. Uh, so IBM Peakskill is a 27 qubit device. Uh, it's what we call a Falcon. Um, I've done two different configurations with Ancilla qubits shown in, in white and uh, in yellow, there are the control qubits. And I've tried to cover the majority of the device with these two different uh, measurement settings. And basically for any given configuration, all of the Ancilla qubits are measured simultaneously and all of the, Clifford, or the control qubits have Clifford gates applied simultaneously, right? Uh, for my benchmarking, I'm going to do 15 sequences, or sorry, 15 different sequence lengths up to 150 mid-circuit measurements, um, 40 random sequences, 10, 24 shots. And like I said, now I'm just going to show you some different examples of the kind of errors you could see and that we, we did see. So the sort of like most, you know, the, the, the easy case is, okay, there's no error. And this is really just to show you what these, uh, what these plots mean. So in red, purple, and black, I'm going to show the control qubit RB decay curves, right? And the, in the, the, uh, the legends are going to show the error for Clifford for the control qubits. And then in blue, cyan, and gray, I'm going to show the ancilla decay curves with, again, the, the legends indicating the error per measurement of the ancillas. So, you know, this is a no error, no error induced curve because the ancilla curves are all roughly flat with zero EPM. And I picked these particular, this particular ancilla to, to, to demonstrate that MCMRB is insensitive to misassignment error, right? And what I mean by that is you can look and see that, you know, this, this ancilla actually has pretty bad readout fidelity. It's like 92% or so, right? But there's no change in the decay curve as you increase the number of mid-circuit measurements. And that's because just like any RB protocol, misassignment error just ends up in spam, right? And like I said, this is a particularly bad qubit that I wanted to emphasize that with. Um, and then the important thing is, okay, these, the purple and red curves lie on top of each other, more or less, there's no difference with or without interleaved measurements. So this is a, you know, a no error example. We could do, you know, look at something more complicated, like a non q and error on the ancilla, right? Um, so here, the control qubit decays are almost the same. Um, if you look at their EPCs, they're almost within standard, one standard deviation of one another. Um, you know, this is not a perfect example because I couldn't find any. Uh, from this data set. But what we do see is that there's significant decay of the ancilla, right? So both uh, the, the blue and gray curves, which are when you were doing repeated measurements, are decaying a lot, right? Very fast. There's a lot of EPM. Um, so the fact that the gray curve actually is decaying as well is really the hallmark that this is sort of uh, a non QND error that's impacting the, the ancilla qubit. So this just has bad readout, right? It's just non QND for, for some reason. Um, of course, like I was mentioning before, you do see some separation between purple and red. So without, with and without measurements in both, and then between blue and gray. So there is something else going on. Um, but this was a nice example, at least of, you know, such a strong non-QND error that you see the gray curve, the just repeated measurement curve decaying. Uh, something more interesting that, you know, you couldn't measure without MCMRB, because obviously you can just measure this by repeating measurements uh, or this kind of error. But what you wouldn't see without, without MCMRB is something like a, an, an error that's induced on the control qubits due to measurement. So here you see I'm doing, uh, there's a, really like a large separation between the red curve, which is MCMRB and the purple curve, which is just interleaved delays, right? Um, that's really indicating that the measurement is inducing some error on the control qubit. For us, this is probably start, start shift or cross phasing, right? Due to those like measurement photons leaking into another cavity. Um, again, the ancilla curves are almost flat. Right, there's a little bit of decay in the blue when you do repeated measurements and you do RB. So there is something else going on, and it's been re it's really actually it was really hard to find you know sort of clean examples of this single qubit error uh, because what we observed on peak skill is that there's actually a lot of weak two qubit error, um, but this one is a particularly strong two qubit error, and this is like the cleanest signal, the best example of this sort of particular two qubit error that I could find, and you can see that there's a massive separation between. Um, there, you know, it's almost a factor of, of it's a, yeah, so like almost a factor of two in error rate between when you do repeated measurements and when you don't uh, for the cliff, for the control qubit. And there's also, you know, considerable decay of the ancilla qubit when you're doing repeated measurements with the RB gates. But importantly, the gray curve, which is just repeated measurements, there's no decay there, right? So that's sort of excluding that this is something that's just non-QND, right? It's really some interaction between the control and the ancilla that's causing error on both of them. So this is a two qubit error. And we believe this is what we call a measurement induced collision where basically measurement on the ancilla stark shifts the ancilla 
into near resonance with the control qubit. And as a result, you will only see an error if the control qubit has some population to begin with. And that's only possible in our setup if you're perform or in this, you know, these circuits, if you're performing the Clifford gates on the um, control qubit. So that's basically a summary of the different kinds of errors we'd expect to see and some examples from peak scale. And then just sort of before I end this section of the talk, you know, I promised that um, I, this could be used as, as interleaved RB and I'd done some simulations just to show that. So I looked at um, two different kinds of measurement induced control error, or, uh, both the start shift and the, the uh, cross measurement or cross defacing. And, you know, here's some here on the bottom, you can see plots similar to the ones I've just shown, but these are simulations. So they are only the qubits, only the control qubit impacted. Um, but on top, what I'm showing is in red, the prediction from interleaved RB comparing these two curves as to what the error rate is. And then in black, I'm showing the actual error rate that I simulated, uh, you know, as but the average infidelity measured from the process I simulated. And you can see that the IRB prediction is, is really pretty good, comp you know, compared to the actual value. So it's, it is a, a faithful estimate of the error of the average error rate in the system. All right, so that's the this that's the first um, s section here that I wanted to talk about, and you know I'll pause now for question if there's any questions about this benchmarking suite for mid circuit measurement. Um, I want to emphasize again how that you know this gives us quantitative uh, estimates for measurement or the error induced on on the non measured qubits, as well as a way to sort of like qual qualitatively identify the different kinds of errors that are happening. Uh, hi, I would like to ask a question, if I may. So are sure. you planning to uh, post the results of this benchmark for every uh, chip you are providing for the users somewhere in the calibration uh, structure, which you can, which I can pull from your database? Right. So, so yeah, so there's ongoing discussions internally um, as to uh, whether that will be the case. Uh, you know, this this sort of benchmark is really important for devices that have feed forward capability or have mid circuit measurement capability, which is a, a growing number of devices at IBM Quantum, but it isn't all of them yet, right? Um, so I think this is something that we will we will potentially plan to report in the future. Um, what I can say though is that um, I'm actually really happy to announce that I would say within the next, probably in the next by the end of the year, if not within the next month. Uh, this benchmarking suite will be available through the Qiskit experiments um, uh, interface that will allow you to basically, you know, with one line of code, run this benchmarking suite on any IBM device. Uh, you'll just call, you know, the MCMRB, tell it what qubits you want it to do it on, and it will do it for you and return data very similar to what I presented here. You know, we haven't quite narrowed down exactly the presentation format we want because I'm not even sold on the way I put it in the paper. But um, you know, it will all the data, raw data will be there. Thank you. Yeah, quick question. Um, so you have basically a, a basic form of like interleaved RB for measurement here, right? Your your two or your your top plot on the right and your middle plot. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering if are there similar theoretical bounds on your average error rate? Um, for this interleaved measurement RB, similar to how there are theoretical bounds on the average error rate for interleaved RB of a gate? Uh, yeah, so if um, it actually will depend on the kind of error. So if if the error is uh, not entangling, so if it's not a two qubit error like this, right, then um, all of the standard bounds that come from IRB will apply uh, directly to the error that's induced on the, on the control qubits. Uh, I think in, you know, the, If the error is entangling, um, there is some, there is, there are bounds from simul simultaneous RB that sort of uh, can tell you what you would anticipate. The problem is that, and this is something uh, we, we struggle with, you, you, we aren't randomizing the ancilla operate control qubit because there's no gates there. So those bound, those results aren't directly applicable, um, unfortunately. So yeah, it's, it's, it is harder to say with confidence for the for induced two qubit errors uh, whether or not those those bounds are valid. Okay, but there's no like uh, equivalent derivation for the measurement. No, we, okay. no, we ha we we haven't done an we ha so in the in the form in the in the case where there is no entangling error, the derivation is trivial. It's exactly the same one as it exactly follows from the standard IRB paper. 
Um, in the case where there is entangling error, I think even if it's if it, even if these were gates, it's non-trivial. So we haven't we did not do it for uh, for non for this these like general processes. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, there's a question in the chat. Okay, oh, just uh, okay. All right, um, okay. So I'm going to uh, quickly talk. Well, I'm going to move on to um, a next. There's one other, there's another section that I wanted to talk about, uh, which is um, work I did again with with Peter, um, and this you can find it in the published version or the archive version on what we call spectator decay and induced defacing. Um, and I think for in the interest of time, I'm probably going to skip the last two sections of my talk. It's a little too ambitious for me, uh, but the reason I want to talk about this is I really want to emphasize um, the importance of errors that can emerge when devices become more complicated and when uh, and even systems that you think you completely understand. So I'm going to be extremely pedagogical and say, let's think about the Ramsey experiment, right? Um, now, let's, I imagine I just want to measure the phase evolution of this symbol, Hamil simple Hamiltonian, you know, induces some, some gate, some phase gate like this, right? Um, so what do I do? Well, okay, I can initialize in the in an X eigenstate by a Hadamard gate, let the phase evolve for some time. For an example, let's say I let it evolve to the point where it implements a two pi over five gate, right? Um, then do an, again another Hadamard and measure ground state probability. If I do that, right, I'll get some simple sinusoidal curve like this as a function of the, the phase angle, right? Which doesn't have to be two pi over five. Now, if I wanted to just remove this unwanted phase evolution, right, I could just do a hot echo, right? Put an X gate in the middle, splits up the phase evolution. And again, I'll just have a flat line the whole time for, for regardless of how long I wait between Hadamards and X gates, right? Because it just flips the sign in some sense of the phase evolution. Now, let's imagine I had a fluctuating frequency, right? Uh, say there's some temporal fluctuations of delta as a, and this could, you know, assuming white noise lead to something like a master equation with some decay at a rate one over T phi, right? So this is just pure dephasing. Um, and then the off-diagonal element of the density matrix will decay again at that rate, one over T phi. And if you look at the results of the Ramsey exper experiment, either the vanilla Ramsey or with the Han echo, you will see this decaying exponential for the Han echo and this decaying oscillation for the Ramsey. So the really the only important thing I'm trying to emphasize here is that Ramsey experiments measure the decay of an off-diagonal matrix element in the, for a single qubit, right? All, all you know, very very basic physics for for those for the audience, I'm sure. So let's think about transmon qubits for a second, right? Anharmonic oscillators. Imagine they're linearly coupled through maybe a bus resonator, maybe some capacitive cu coupling. What well, doesn't matter? We'll have some effective coupling between the two transmon qubits, right? And then in the limit that you know where the, the the tuning between them is much larger than this coupling, we get this effective longitudinal ZZ interaction, right? At some rate that I'm going to call new. Right, so again, this is restricted now to the qubit subspace. Our total Hamiltonian is just you know frequency of qubit one, frequency of qubit two, and then the ZZ interaction. Right, so it's purely diagonal. So let's think about what this looks like for the different qubits. Right, so let's imagine we fix the state of qubit two and think of okay, what's the Hamiltonian on qubit one? Well, okay, if qubit two is in the ground state, right, it's just this, it's just the same. The you know frequency of qubit one shifted by minus two nu. And, and if it's in, if qubit one, two is in the excited state, it's just the frequency of qubit one shifted up by, by you know by plus two nu. So real case, okay, so the, you know very again all very simple stuff. Both of them just generate some static phase, right? Uh, and we know that we can look at this in a Ramsey experiment. We can see the different oscillations of the different frequencies. And in particular, if we did a Han echo, we should be able with no issue to cancel both of these phases and just get a flat line, you know, perfect. Uh, Excitation probability, or in reality, have some decay due to, to, to dephasing, right? Which which is external to what we're talking about here. So let's do that in an experiment. Let's do a Han echo sequence with our spectator initialized in the ground state. Okay, great. We get some exponential decay curve. Shocking, right? Um, and we you know we we call the rate of this exponential decay t two echo, right? Now let's do the exact same thing and just initialize the spectator in the excited state. So we should see no difference. Right from what our, from all, what the theory I've been talking about so far, but what we do see instead is an much an unexpected much faster decay rate, right? And all we've changed here is the state of spectator two, right? So what does that mean? Does that mean there are some fluctuations in the ZZ interaction, right? But what what effect would cause fluctuations or cause error or this additional dephasing only when the qubit is excited, right? If there was if ZZ was fluctuating, you would think that 
that would cause the phasing regardless of, what, of the state of qubit two. Moreover, we can excite more spectators. So go from one excited to two to three and see you know, stronger and stronger decay and these sort of weak little oscillations that are actually real, not, not a data or not an artifact of the data. So what's going on? So we've dubbed this effect, spectator decay induced dephasing. And let me explain to you how it works. So imagine this is a world line of the evolution of our spectator qubit, which we'll say is in spin up, which is maybe you know, the, the excited state. So it evolves for some period of time, and then all of a sudden it flips. So I'm thinking of like a quantum trajectories viewpoint of quantum evolution, right? Um, and that will have induced some phase uh, of say phi, which is proportional to the time of that it was in the excited state times new, the ZZ interaction, that will do some phase on, on qubit one, right? The, the, our other qubit. And then for the rest of the duration of this time, you know, it evolves in the ground state, so we have, okay, some other phase with a different sign minus, you know, for the other time. So if you look at the total phase accumulated by qubit one due to the dynamics of the spectator for this trajectory, it's, you know, just new times the difference in these two times. Let's think about another trajectory. Okay, evolves, evolves, evolves. Oh, now it's, you know, stay excited for a longer period of time and then it decays, right? So now we have some other phase phi that's proportional now to this T1 prime. And again, you know, it continues to evolve in the ground state and we have some other evolution time. So the total accumulated phase for this trajectory is proportional to the difference of these prime times, right? So it's a different fa phase by prime. In, in particular, and what you can show is that the total accumulated phase for all possible trajectories is a random variable between the interval zero and two pi times tau, which is where tau is the total wait time of our Ramsey experiments, right? And if you were to average over all of these trajectories, it actually looks like dephasing. And so that's what's explaining the additional dephasing we see in these, um, in these experiments. Now, we can do a much more detailed theory model and calculate the decay or the, ev the evolution of the off diagonal matrix element uh, for an arbitrary number of spectators. Um, and what you can see is it get, you get this long expression, but let me break down to, for you what each of the terms here are. Um, this is just the intrinsic T, you know, T2 of the control qubit of the control qubit we're measuring, right? So it'll decay at some T rate T2. That's, you know, that is always there no matter what we do. This second product is um, just the phase rotation. So just the, the normal ZZ rotation for all, for all qubits or for all spectator qubits that started in their ground state, right? Um, so that there's no possibility that they decay or flip. And then this term, you know, is, a Q, is, is, a, is counting one, the phase evolution for qubits that started in the excited state, but then there's also this additional dephasing proportional to one over T1 of the spectators, right? So this is accounting for when the spectators flip, they cause this additional induced dephasing. And you can actually show that, you know, in the, in a, in the appropriate limits, um, the effective T2 or the effective, you know, the one over T2, the effective dephasing rate of the control qubit is just, it's, it's proportional at least to its original dephasing rate plus just a sum of all the T of one over the T1, so all the decay rates of the spectators. Uh, so that's, you know, really sort of nice, easy way to, 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 uh, to calculate this. And if we go back to this slide, these, these uh, blue and the curves are actually the theory predictions. So you see they match very nicely the data, even capturing the oscillations that you would expect from, uh, from this uh, formula. And I will point out, of course, um, that right as we were finishing our paper, uh, my postdoc supervisor, Ash, and his uh, student at the time, uh, uh, Alexander, um, actually solved this system uh, in general. Uh, so this, this sort of just a bit of IV model is exactly solvable as they proved, and you can get exact general solutions to a variety of different cases from, uh, from their paper. So the last thing I want to mention is, of course, this is, you know, this is not actually an incoherent effect, right? It's only incoherent in the ensemble average. It's actually coherent. And that means you can echo it away. And that's actually a really good test that this model is correct, right? So what you do is, you know, uh, because on a shot basis, the, the, the sign only flips once, right? You look at every individual shot, it's not gonna be incoherent. So you can do more with more echoes, like a CPMG sequence, right? To try to correct more and more of the, of the phase accumulation that will, you know, be different for every trajectory. But if you can correct on smaller and smaller time windows, you can correct more and more of it, right? Uh, and we've actually shown that, that it works, right? You can, you know, the blue curves are just CPMG with the spectators prepared in the zero state. And you can see it's more or less constant. And the red is when you prepare the excited state. And you can see that we can recover 
almost all of the, or actually all of the, of the lifetime of the qubit by performing, you know, a very, very dense CPMG. CPM. All right, so that is um, everything I wanted to say about this novel, uh, you know, decoherence mechanism, um, where we showed that the expected decay doesn't induce this effective phasing on, on the other qubits, right? It is coherent, so we can correct it. Um, and I just want to sort of mention, you know, where, what kind of circuits do we see this being an issue, right? It's definitely going to be circuits with long idles, right? So something like quantum memory or, you know, maybe error correction when you're doing your parity check circuits, that might take a long time. Um, you can find more details in our paper. And I, I also want to just point out that, you know, I think this is a really nice example of what I talked, what I mentioned in my, one of my motivation slides, where it's an error that's more than the sum of its parts, right? You could just say, okay, well, I have some dephasing on my qubits. That's one error rate. I have some decay on my qubits. That's another error rate. And then to lowest order, these errors are just going to add, and that's going to be my total error rate. But here you're seeing really that your dephasing itself is actually modified by the presence of decay on other qubits, right? Um, and that drastically changes performance. All right. Um, I do, you know, I'm, I think I have about. 15 minutes, so uh, I can pause here for questions, but uh, if there are none, I can I maybe show a few more slides. A quick question. So it looks like here you're quantifying the effect of spectator qubits on maybe active qubits, but what about the other way around, the effect of active qubits on spectators? Right, so I guess, I mean, I, I, let me tell, let me, I say, if I rephrase your question as, you know, how would this manifest in a situation where all the qubits are, in, are operating at the same time? Right, uh, where they're they're all active, they're all performing gates. I think that is a uh, considerably more complicated problem. Right, um, I think this effect will show up, you know, regardless of whether uh, for any idle time in the in the circuit. Right, um, so if there ever if any qubits are ever idle, this this can be an issue. Right, um, it's just you know we, this is th you can think about this this Ramsey sequence as a way of really measuring the rate. Right, and then wonder and then you can ask, okay. For realistic idols that I actually have in my circuit, how much error is this going to add to what what would happen, right? Um, but the the important point is just like it's just thinking about T1s and T2s isn't sufficient, right? Um, and unfortunately, you know, idle times grow as circuit as circuit width grows, right? Because less qubits are in, are ever are actually going to be active at any given point in the circuit um, because of scheduling constraints. So, would you suggest then instead of idling them, just echoing them during the idle period? Uh, yeah, so I think it's really, I think in general, you know, echoing, especially for fixed frequency devices with, with uh, unavoidable ZZ, echoing is a really good idea. Um, what this is actually showing in some sense is that you might need to do denser echoes than you would think, right? Like if it was just ZZ, you could just do a single echo in the middle of your idle, right? Um, but here we're sort of arguing that you might want to actually consider a deeper echo. And then, you know, obviously there's some uh, error that's induced by these CPMG gates, right? So you have to you know, you have to balance the additional error introduced by these gates compared to the error induced by the, uh, the spectator decay to phasing. Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right. Um, so are there any more questions about this section? Okay, so I just have a few slides left then actually on, um, on two actually ni other nice pieces of work that I will say that I wasn't involved in at all. Um, but I thought they were really interesting for this audience and they tie nicely into the theme of what I'm talking about here. And the first I wanna talk about is, uh, you know, I just talked about how bad ZZ interactions are in fixed frequency devices. And I really wanna, and I wanna show some work from Holger Haas, uh, who is my colleague at IBM um, about, you know, correcting ZZ, right? And it really ties in nicely because uh, some, com some very similar work was done uh, at Berkeley as well. So as I mentioned before, you know, frequency trans one qubits, right? Our, our coherences continue to improve. That's that's great, um, but we have this issue of the ZZ coupling, right? That comes on because of the fact that the devices are, are anharmonic oscillators. So uh, sometime recently, there was a proposal from IBM, and similar work was done at Berkeley, but to, to cancel a ZZ by sort of by what the what's called the sizzle effect, right? Um, so you apply stark tones to your two qubits, and uh, you know that induces a frequency shift on the qubits locally but it also induces an effective ZZ, or you could say it modifies the total ZZ, and it's possible to actually cancel this, right? Uh, or, you know, you could remove it, or you could also increase it with just stark tones on, uh, or just, you know, dr off resonant drives on uh, the two qubits themselves. And, and you know, there's, these are the references both from IBM and from, from Berkeley demonstrating this, this uh, technique. 
So what uh, Holger has done is he's shown one that you can do this sort of mitigation using a single tone on a full 27 qubit IBM Falcon, right? Where with sizzle off, you see, you know, our max CZ on any pair is something like 100 kilohertz and they sort of the lowest we get is we see is like 50. But then with sizzle on, you can drop that down to something like two kilohertz. So it's a huge, you know, two orders of magnitude reduction, almost reduction, right? Unfortunately, the price you pay for that is that this does induce extra dephasing, likely due to fluctuations of the uh, of the amplitude or the frequency of the of the start drives. So you could quantify that by looking at the difference in the dephasing rates uh, with or without the sizzle tones on, and you see that you know there's they can be pretty significant, but they roughly scale with whatever the induced start shifts are as well. Um, so that gives us a clue that we can correct this by actually just reducing that start shift. And one way to do that is to reduce power. And the way, you, the way that Holger was able to do that is by introducing a multi-tone sizzle, where he now breaks the device up into different frequency or frequency subsets and applies you know, sizzle with different frequency tones that allows, us, that allows him to use lower power on average across the device. Um, and similarly, you know, uh, where the, you can see a pretty significant this time, not quite but as much, but about an order of magnitude reduction in sizzle uh, in the worst cases, right? Or actually on average. Um, but importantly, the extra dephasing uh, actually went down, not quite as much as we'd hoped, but quite significantly. You know, the, the outliers are no longer sort of in the uh, 0.03, um, you know, regime, but uh, closer to uh, 0.01, 0 0.02. And it's much more tightly, tightly packed because we've reduced the average um, start shift. And then I'll just quickly also run through the last thing I wanted to show. Again, this is not work that I'm involved in, but something that we're really excited about at IBM, which is probabilistic error cancellation, this error mitigation technique I was talking about. Um, and here, the idea really is that the first thing you do is learn an error model. The second thing you do is you calculate the inverse of that error model, and then you can cancel the errors probabilistically by, a, by actually sort of implementing that inverse in a probabilistic manner through sampling. And the only reason you can do that is because the error model you're learning or you're the way and you're enforcing that your circuits have polystochastic noise. So you can very simply invert them. And then you can implement that invert, inverted error model by sort of randomly applying with the correct probabilities polygates as this sort of circuit is showing, you know, you have some error process that occurs in your circuit. And then if you just randomly apply for every iteration of your or every instance of your circuit, a different polygate you can, on average, mitigate the effect of that error by applying the inverse channel, right? So what we've done here is, you know, we're applying many more circuits, right, with additional gates, but we're getting an expectation value or a result at the end of the, or at, at the, end of the circuit that's much closer to ideal, right, much closer to the unmitigated signal. So we're trading off resources, in this case, time and, or circuit count for accuracy, right? And it does require a little bit more efficient but extra classical processing. Um, and just in the context of sort of, uh, you know, verification, validation, characterization, I want to emphasize that we're learning what's called a sparse polylindblad model, or otherwise known as a generator model, where you describe your error map in terms of a generator L that is, in this case, polystochastic. So it just has random applications of poly errors. We're going to assume some sort of sparsity that things aren't connected like all to all. It's just, you know, maybe locale, it's maybe locality or two body interactions or four body. So that gives us some like polynomial depth, the number of terms we need to characterize so that we can actually do it, right? We're also very importantly gonna assume that error is Markovian, right? Which means it, uh, you know, it's not gonna change over the, in this context, it's not gonna change over the duration of our experiment. And then when we do that, we can calculate these parameters gamma that define the error rates in our system. And we can also define what we call gamma, sorry, these are lambdas, what we call gamma, which is a metric of the number, or this actually ends up being the, the extra cost in the sampling we have to do and the overhead we have to do to be able to do the inverse. Um, and it's actually very tightly related to entanglement fidelity, which is something else that we can more commonly measure. So just to end, I'll just quickly flash some results from Ewot and Zlatko's paper where they showed they could do this on a trotterized Ising model on 10 qubits. And in this case, looking at uh, depth four or width four observables, these ones, you can say, okay, or these are the what they're measuring. Um, this is actually just gonna be on four qubits I'm showing here, but they're looking at sort of the average single body observables, how accurate are they? And you can look at the right plot here. This is sort of like, uh, this is some sort of error metric for the distance between the average single qubit observable um, and the ideal, whether you do this PEC or not. And you can see without PEC, the error gets pretty bad, especially for deeper number, deeper circuits with more trotter steps. But with PEC, it's a pre pretty impressive and significant improvement. And then you go to say 10 qubits even, 
and that were with 10 observable and that again, you know, PEC is able to considerably improve the signal at the cost of many more circuits that you have to run and sample. All right, so that is um, all from me today. You know, I think I, what I've talked about today is that the fact that we are really pushing devices into, pl into places they haven't been before, right? With lower and lower error rates, whether it's through something like Sizzle or PEC, right? But, and we need to be simultaneously developing the tools to characterize them, right? Whether it be mid-circuit RB for measure, mid-circuit measurement and feed forward and things like this, which we haven't done before, which, you know, it's a new technique or new a new capability that devices have, or looking at errors that are emergent like spectator decay induced to phasing. I do think there's still lots to be done here, right? There's the big question of, you know, what errors are going to be most detrimental to the applications we care about, and then how do we design efficient schemes to measure them? All right, thank you. Okay, let's thank Luca. Are there, are there any more questions or comments? Hi, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I had a quick question about the way you implemented this, this sizzle for this large system. Um, was that ZZ cancellation tone something that was always on, like uh, even not under gate operation, or is it something that's turned on when you're actually addressing the, the qubits? Uh, as far as I know, the ZZ's up, up the, sorry, the, um, the sizzle tones are always on. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, hey, Luke, good comments? to see you. Uh, okay. Good to see you, Ellie. Yeah, how are you? Yeah, uh, doing well. And thank you for the talk, it was actually really excellent. Um, Thanks. So uh, my question, I guess, is um, related to uh, all this benchmarking work here. And I think a clear um, conclusion that you can draw here is that, that spectators actually play a pretty big role. And a lot of the locality assumptions we have about errors may not be as strong as we think they are. Can we get a sense of like, uh, from these uh, metrics, uh, how far errors can spread? Um, along with that, and does that inform sort of the size of, say, error correcting codes that you want to build and the level of connectivity that you want to have in a system? So I think um, I think the example I've shown here, for instance, like the S did effect, right? So that really actually respects the topology of the coupling network, right? In the sense that you um, that's only going to propagate as far as there are ZZs, right? So you could okay argue that you know you will you will have next nearest neighbor ZZs induced by Know, two layers of coupling and maybe those play a role um but like, you know then it's a question of estimating what the error how big an error that would actually induce right um on the on the other hand i think there's definitely been a push in the community towards developing metrics that can do what you just said where that can sort of try to estimate the 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 width of crosstalk and um one thing that we're actually exploring a lot recently is this uh, mirror randomized benchmarking that Sandia developed and actually uh, Jordan, Hines, uh, Jordan Hines, right? Is the lead author of this great paper from, from Berkeley and Sandia. Um, you know, there were some nice conclusions there drawn on, uh, on, on the depth or the width, sorry, of, of crosstalk, which was actually measured on IBM devices. And I, I, you know, I think, I think there, there we, we had some internal questions about, about um, how that was done. And so that we're trying to understand that. But my hope is that, is that techniques like that can give you some indication, and we're here. The idea is you compare um, benchmarking on, you know, n qubits to the predictions from benchmarking on subsets of qubits, right? Um, and I, I hope that that can give some indication about the about how far crosstalk spreads. But I think, you know, one thing that I'm myself very interested in also is in designing protocols that are tailored to test for multi-body error. That is like crosstalk, right? Um, and it's it's challenging because you always have this this background noise of you know if you if you care about a two qubit error or a three qubit error, you always have the background noise of of simultaneous one qubit errors happening on all your qubits, right? Um, so I, I I think I I I think I would say that I agree that uh, strongly that these are are definitely things the community needs and they're things that people are working on, but I don't think we have a clear um, a clear smoking gun of how to do this. You know, there's there's uh, these sort of the, even something like this poly this poly learning that uh, goes into PEC. Like this is another way to do this, right? Where you have to where you're. Um, but there, you know, there you're you're paying the cost of full process demography, and you're paying the cost of as you increase the the or as you increase the the width of the interactions you consider in your generator, 
you have to, you know, the, you're getting closer and closer to full process demography. So you're, you're, you're paying more and more in the cost of resources, right? Um, so I, I think what we need is some sort of diagnostics or benchmarks that can quickly tell us if there is this error, if there's multi-body correlated error that we can then learn with more, with more expensive techniques. And uh, one like minor follow-up to that, I guess, uh, that's sort of on the idea of, of sort of the spatial extent of these errors. I, I'm curious about if this mid-circuit measurement RV can also tell us sort of the uh, temporal extent. Like, can it tell us how often, like, is there a way to distract from this? Like how often one should er uh, do error correction um, okay, by comparing sort of the gate error rates and the measurement error rates all in sort of one um, suite? I think, yeah, I think that's a really uh, intriguing question. I think, you know, I think there I would say if we could extend this to say MCMRV for a stabilizer circuit, for instance, right? Um, we could say, okay, here is the penalty I'm paying for measuring a stabilizer, right? Here's the error, the, the aggregate error that's induced on my data qubits and my ancilla when I do the stabilizer measurement, right? And then you can compare that or you can keep put that into a comparison with uh, or some you know some formula with uh, the idle errors, right? Um, and then you might be able to say, okay, well, this is the optimal density where I'm not introducing more errors than I am correcting, right? Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I do. Um, look, thanks for the talk. It was really nice. Um, I'm curious to get your thoughts on um, kind of QCVV as, as we move towards error correction in the sense that we have this bunch of benchmarking suites and the majority of them twirl our errors because it makes them easier to measure and extract. And I'm curious how well you think these are going to provide or, or what, what information or guarantees these will provide us for error correction um, where we maybe care about a bit more about worst case error rates and, and the impact of coherent errors and large scale correlated errors and these things that are maybe even non-Markovian errors, these things that are a bit more exotic. So what needs to happen in the field to um, maybe provide us with more robust guarantees for error correction? So, okay, so I think uh, there's a multifaceted answer to your question. Um, I will make, I'll do the, the short comment first, which is I think non-Markovian errors are, uh, you know, that, that is a real problem. Um, and that is something that the QCVV field really needs to start uh, wrestling with. That I think we're, we, we have, you know, the underlying basically the vast majority, if not almost all QCV protocols is the assumption of Markovianity, right? Um, uh, I, will just, I will just tease that there's gonna be some potentially very exciting work coming out of some colleagues of mine at IBM, hopefully with, by the end of the year on to do with non-Markovian errors. Um, but I think there's still, but even, you know, even if we assume that everything is perfectly Markovian, which is a, a wrong assumption, right? There's still um, a lot of, of issues with, that you have raised, raised. In particular, you know, randomized benchmarking, cycle benchmarking, sparse poly, sparse poly limblad learning, all of these twirl errors, right? Whether they be by the Clifford group or the, or the poly group to make the channels either depolarizing or poly stochastic, right? Um, and I think, you know, one question that I don't think the community has a good answer to is, do error correcting circuits also twirl errors, right? Um, would you expect to see, would you expect your, your error in your error correcting circuits where you're running not, you know, stabilizer circuits over and over again, would that somehow look uh, um, poly stochastic? And, you know, that might sound like obviously not, but we, we do know that something like direct RB works, right? Um, and so maybe, maybe even only with a, a small modification to, uh, to an error correcting circuit, you can make the errors look poly stochastic. So that's, you know, that's a, that would be a, that would be nice. That would be a hope because then we could more reliably believe that some of the, um, the techniques we can use work. And the, the flip side is of course, is, you know, what actually matters to, to error correction? Like you're alluding to it, do we care about the worst case error? Is it the diamond norm, right? Or do we care about the average error? Because if it's just the average error, which may or may not be the case, we don't know, I think, uh, then you don't even need to hope that your circuits are poly stochastic. You can just measure the poly stochastic channels, the, 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 the twirled version's error, and that'll give you your average error rate, right? I think the reality is that that's probably not the case. And there are many places where we will need to know more than just the average error. 
that's why I think, uh, that's why, you know, to tie in something I said to, to Ravi, that's why I think it's important to start to think about diagnosing or diagnostic texts or tests that tell us about not just, you know, for these sort of QCVV idolized circuits that give us an error rate, right? Give us uh, a confidence that say we don't have, or we have within this expectation that there's no way we have, a, you know, one E minus three, three body error. It's below one E minus six or something, right? Um, to sort of start to eliminate these, what, I'm, what I've been calling catastrophic errors, right? As a first step to understanding what we need to, to really measure. But I also think that, you know, we, we th this is gonna, this, I'm not giving you any really good answers here because I think this is just like what the field needs to do, right? I think we we also need people who do QEC research to start actually simulating under realistic error models and to start telling the QCVB people, these are the errors that matter, right? Uh, because right now it sort of feels like we're just trying to characterize everything and that is is an impossible task. Yeah, I think, thanks for your answer. I also feel like there's somewhat of a disconnect between the two communities, so. Uh, anything that brings them together, I think, is, is good. Yeah, think, thanks a lot for your talk again. No worries. Yeah, thank you. yeah, great, great talk, Luca. Let's thank Luca again.